Thanks for joining us on Shannon's Club TV, where we look back on the most significant cars from Australian roads and racetracks. In today's episode, we have a special opportunity to visit an owner's impressive Italian-themed garage for an up-close look at our feature car. And we'll also get some market advice from the Shannon's auctions team. So let's take a look at the front-wheel drive Alfa Romeo that brought sports car performance to the small car class, the Alfa Sud. The Alfa Sud was Alfa Romeo's first attempt to build a volume selling small car. It was well packaged with a spacious cabin and boot, but it should have been a hatchback. The driving position suited apes better than humans, and its ergonomics were poor to shocking. In some respects, the Sud can be seen as a kind of Italian Subaru Impreza WRX 20 years ahead of its time. The Boxer engine displaced just 1186 cc's but delivered an impressive 63 net brake horsepower. Torque was obviously at a premium, but the top speed was more than 90 miles an hour with effortless cruising at 75. Bear in mind though that a 1967 Corolla could have cruised at this speed too. There were two shades of the Hillman Imp, which was produced in Scotland by untrained workers. The Sud was built ineptly by farmers in a new government-owned plant in southern Italy using low-grade Eastern European steel. What could go wrong? From day one, the Alpha Sud was faster point-to-point -to -point than rivals. It also rusted faster, reportedly some even bubbling in the new car showroom. Mark, I have to say that the Alpha Sud hardly looked like a prospective race car. No, it? you're right. But, but that was part of its charm, I guess, its disarming charm, because under that, ex that sort of conservative exterior, there was a fair bit of sort of Alfa Romeo breeding, you know, like that boxer four-cylinder engine, low centre of gravity, yep. mounted in front of the front axle line, so it had excellent front-to-rear weight distribution. Plus you had um, you know, four-wheel disc brakes, you had rack and pinion steering, and the thing only weighed about, I think it was less than 900 kilos. So it had a lot of things going for it, and it was a lot of fun, apparently, to drive on the racetrack, which I'll get to a bit later on. Despite making its debut at the 1971 Turin Show, the Sud did not arrive in Australia until late 1974. It cost similar money to a Kingswood. What a delight this diminutive Alfa Romeo was. Just about the only point of comparison was the Mini Cooper. Although the little Alfa could also be likened in some respects to the Hillman Imp for its driver appeal and, I suppose, weirdness. The Alfa Sud Ti followed with stronger performance, a five-speed gearbox, comprehensive instrumentation, sports steering wheel and more. It was almost as quick, unbelievably, as an HQ Premier 253 V8 Auto. In 1979, the gorgeous Sprint was introduced and the TI got a 1.5 litre engine. Three years later, all variants had this engine and the TI acquired twin carburetors for an additional 11 horsepower and went hatchback, finally, into the bargain. The Sprint, though, did not get the twin carbs until 1984. Mark, has Australia ever seen a more exciting <laughs> one-make racing series than the one that was put on for the Sud? Well, it would have to be right up there, wouldn't it? And it certainly made sure that Alpha's big-hearted little car left a lasting impression. The infamous Alpha Sud is perhaps best remembered for its propensity to rust before your eyes. But there was a time in the 1980s when its admirable sporting qualities were showcased in a successful one-make series that pitched amateur races against top professionals, including Dick Johnson, Colin Bond and Alan Grice. The Alfa Romeo Trophy, which ran for only two seasons, drew its inspiration from a similar event established in Europe in the 1970s, which culminated each year in the Trofeo Europa Alfa Sud, a sort of Premier League in which the best drivers from each national championship could compete against each other. Australia's first Alfa Romeo trophy in 1983 consisted of six rounds and first prize was certainly worth fighting for, a trip to Italy to compete in the Trofeo Europa at Monza as part of the support program for the Italian Grand Prix. John, the beauty of backing a one-make formula for a manufacturer is that your car is guaranteed to win every race. Yes, I yeah. think that's a very good point. There have been a few one-make series. I look back to the Renault 12 and uh, yeah, the even the, yeah. the Triumph TR7. You 
heads will take, take one of the shops nowadays. And you could almost say that V8 supercars, as it originated, was a, a two-make race, wouldn't you? Yeah, very much. It almost sort of laid the foundation for that sort of motorsport later on. Mm. Yeah. The 1983 Alfa Romeo Trophy was a huge success, providing desperately close racing and unearthing some precocious new talents in Joe Beninka and future multiple Bathurst winner Tony Longhurst. It came down to a winner-take-all final round between Dick Johnson and Colin Bond, with Bond emerging the winner after a collision with Johnson triggered a spectacular barrel rolling exit for the Queenslander. Bond was also in top five contention at Monza until a broken dry shaft forced his retirement. The second and final Alfa Romeo trophy in 1984 was an equally hard fought contest with a new Alfa up for grabs. But this time the winner take all final was between Tony Longhurst and Alan Grice. Longhurst was initially declared the winner from Grice after a bruising battle. But Grice would later claim the spoils after his appeal against Longhurst's rough driving tactics was upheld. As a PR exercise, the two trophy series were pure gold for Alfa Romeo Australia, as it could not have asked for a more credible demonstration of the Alfa Sud's sporting qualities. Sadly though, it could also do nothing to stop the creeping corrosion that would destroy so many of these brilliant little Alphas. Remember, you can read the full road and race histories on the Shannons Club website. My name's Paul O'Connor, um, and I own this 1983 TI Twin Carb Alpha Sud. Being the TI Twin Carb, it's the very last of the Alpha Suds, um, and being a send off model, Alpha Romeo fitted it with alloy wheels and with the unique TI interior, which is fairly fragile interior and you've got to look after it and it's impossible to find in this day and age. I haven't done a lot of work to it over the years, it's been very reliable. The rest of my collection, well, I'm a sports car nut. Car um, is one of 250 that were imported to Australia by Alpha Australia, and it's the very last of the Alpha Suds. It's sort of addictive to drive. It's an old car, so mechanically you're feeling everything. You can feel the gear changes, you feel the brakes. The engine is great and revs out beautifully. It's got ferocious grip and it's a little akin to driving a, an Italian Mini. It still gives me as much enjoyment today when I drive the car as when I first drove it 25 years ago. So I'm a long-term Shannon's customer. I've been insured with Shannon's for over 20 years. I've found them really good in terms of agreeing to values on the motor cars. I've been more than happy being a Shannon's customer over the many years. You've got to look after these cars, the weaknesses being the, the body. Other than maintaining it and keeping it in good condition, I just, uh, just want to enjoy the car. Well, Shannon's National Auctions Manager, Chris Borabon, joins us to bring us right up to date on the Alpha Suit. Welcome to the show. Hello, John. Welcome, Chris. The Alpha Suit, mm. most of them died of rust. <laughs> and I'm thinking that there wouldn't be too many going through the auction rooms. And I'm also thinking that the cost of doing one up would be prohibitive. I, I think you're right on all those points. Um, mm. Yes, we, we don't actually see them through the auction house at all. Uh, and I think that's probably because... The you know the, the the low volume of survivors that we have here in Australia actually are held fairly tightly amongst Alpha Romeo Club members. Mm. And does it mean that a well preserved car, and I'm assuming there are some of them, uh, is worth a bit? Look, I think it's I think they're, they're made for an interesting car. I think it's mm. you know to try and find one in good condition is actually a very rare thing today. Yeah. Uh, you know, as you said, given the survival rates quite low, and they did have the big rust issue problems with them uh, because of the recycled steel that they used on those cars. Which brings a question: like, if you if you bought a second-hand one that needed some work, you know that rust issue is going to be right through the car. I mean, how do you restore yeah. an Alpha suit? Well, it, it could be. Uh, you know, again, it's. Uh, uh, you will try and find, mm. I guess, the most structurally sound 
you know, Alpha said that you can. Um, and but, that, but that's a real hit and miss, isn't it? Like some it cars is, just rusted be. unbelievably and some yep. managed to get through reasonably unscathed. So you have yes, to do a lot yeah. of a lot of detective work, wouldn't you? I think you do. And, mm. and look, I think the reality is you're not going to carry out a full restoration on a, an no. Alpha Sud, but mm. you are probably going to maintain it or get the car mechanically correct and, uh, you know, and utilise it for... Probably what we see most people doing these days who have the sorts are mainly for club events. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. And, and uh, yeah, club runs, club events, that's probably where you'd, you'd see I the majority of them. I think what we're finding now, mm. and the Alpha Sud typifies this, we're having a movement where enthusiast cars all finish up going into clubs and they don't get advertised generally. Well, well they want to hang on to the good ones. You know, like, yeah, so we've got the good ones. That's very true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, actually, so. that's a really good point. Yeah. I think, um, you know, the, when the club members know that there is a good car out there, mm. you know, they'll probably try and put their name against it yeah. if that car ever comes onto sure. the market. And that's yeah. why, you know, we don't see a lot of cars sometimes come up on the market mm. because they do change hands amongst friends and, and amongst um, and, club and, members. And the corollary of that is if you buy such a car, like like the Alpha Sud in good condition, you will want to belong to a car club mm. to keep it yeah. that way and to get yeah. Yeah, contacts and, and it's so contacts on. and the support. I think the yeah, support yeah. that you get from the club uh, is paramount for the uh, you know mm. survival rate of these cars. Sometimes now we had uh, I think we had three different engine capacities here: 1.2, 1.3 oh, when we got the five, first the TI, yeah. and then everything ended up with the 1.5, including that mm. beautiful Alpha Sud Sprint. That's a really lovely looking car. Do you see many of those around? Again, I don't, we don't really see any mm. much on the market. I think uh, it, you will see it through uh, club members, mm. uh, and that's probably where they're held. Yep. So what would be the pecking order? Would the uh, Alpha Sud Sprint be at the top and you work your way down through the TIs? Is that, would, would that be the normal process in terms I, of desirability? You think so. I think that's, mm. that's probably where the order is. Uh, and again, because you don't see too many of them out there in the open marketplace, it's very hard to sort of identify those pecking orders exactly. Mm. Look, I think the Sud has always been that entry-level Alpha mm. and, and that's why you yes. know, it was amongst families and um, you know, it was used... And, and that's that's predominantly it was the A to B car, mm. uh, and then later on in life is where the, probably the collectability became. Indeed, in, yep. and the yep. bottom yes. line is the overriding theme with that car. It's just so much fun to drive, yes. <laughs> even today. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 yeah, Good. Thanks for joining us, Chris. No problem at all. Thank you. And remember, you can keep up to date with all the latest Shannon's auctions news on the Shannon's Club website. If you'd like your own competition image of the Alpha Sud, visit the huge motorsport archive at autopix.com.au. John, looking at the Alpha Sud, you know, quite often a lot of those cars that came out of Italy, the UK at the time, everyone looked at them and thought, if only the Japanese or the Germans could have taken that design and built it, it just would have been a completely different story, wouldn't it? Well, I imagine that uh, Lexus had built the first yeah. Alpha Sud. It's a contradiction in terms, of course. But mm. um, yes, it's just as if... There are too many variables involved, even mm. before you've got a militant workforce. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Alpha Sud was one of those cars that on paper it looked absolutely brilliant. Mm. It was great to drive, but it was terribly flawed. And we saw that this year. It wasn't just Alpha Sud. We saw you know, a lot of the cars that came out of the UK, particularly in the 1970s, with all the dramas they had. If those cars had been built by you know, manufacturing strong strongholds like Japan and, and Germany, um, we would have had some really, really great cars you know, these days. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. agree more. Yeah. Well, we hope you've enjoyed reflecting on the unique Alpha Sud, and we hope you can join us next time on Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now.